make sure you download the app. You can explore on foot or in car or on your bike. 20 plus neighborhoods, including Evanston. And Evanston actually has been an open house Chicago neighborhood since 2015. They've been a part of the program. So this is their fifth anniversary of uh, being a part of open house Chicago. Uh, so you've got the app where you can do virtual tour, uh, excuse me, uh, self-guided tours. And then we have virtual programs like the one today. Um, we're offering programs uh, two to three times a day. This is actually our second program today. So just go to openhousechicago.org and you can sign up for a program. There really is so much to do. So become a member because you enjoy OHC perks and then you enjoy the CAC throughout the year. Um, there's tours, there's programs and more, and we will be doing virtual programming through uh, the end of March, possibly the beginning of April, if not longer. So it is gonna be, we wanna encourage you to become a member. And I also want to take a moment to thank our presenting sponsor, Wintrust Bank. They've supported OHC for the past three years. And this year, they've really uh, been tremendously supportive because we completely pivoted how we do Open House Chicago, and they were with us 100%. So big shout out to Wintrust Bank. So before I turn things over to our speakers, I wanted to do a little housekeeping. So you're all muted and your videos are off. Um, if you're having any tech issues, use the chat function. We have staff there ready to help you. And our staff will be dropping links that you can see based on some of the things that the speakers say. So if you wanted to follow up at a later time, you would have those links. Um, and then uh, we're actually going to stop and do questions twice during this program. Um, so uh, you'll use the Q&A function. Uh, for that. So um, uh, let, I just want to mention also as we get this program started before I introduce the speakers that I already mentioned that Evanston's been an OHC neighborhood for the last five years. And one really interesting thing to me about Open House Chicago this year is that we've been in neighborhoods for every year but we have not really had as much community engagement as we're having uh, this year. So it's really through our virtual programs that we have been able to invite community members to join us and talk about their community um, uh, and we to talk about their community and really to hear the voices from the community. So that's actually what we're gonna be doing today. Um, our two speakers, uh, the first uh, speaker is Dino Robinson. He is the founder and executive director of Shorefront Legacy Center that collects, preserves, and educates people about Black history on Chicago's suburban North Shore. He is a graduate of Loyola University with a BA in communication design and a minor in African American studies. And outside of his career in advertising and design, the Shorefront Legacy, which he started, as I mentioned, in 1995, has accumulated over 300 linear feet of archival material illustrating the lives and experience, experiences of Blacks on the North Shore for public use. Our other speaker today is Chris Hartzell, and she is the Director of Facilities, Visitor Service, Services, and Collections at the Evanston History Center. She directs the preservation and restoration of the Charles Gates Dawes House, a National Historic Landmark and home of the Evanston History Center. And she's also the curator of the Evanston History Center's extensive collection of art, furnishings, and artifacts and oversees the docent guided tours of the museum. So for our pro, oops, one more thing about Chris. She has a certificate in historic preservation from Northwestern and a master of science in historic preservation from the School of the Art Institute. So the way we're gonna do this is Dino is gonna do a, present, uh, a short presentation about the process of how it worked that we um, could start to acknowledge the role of African-Americans in shaping the Evanston community. And then uh, both of them will be talking specifically about some of the sites. So without further ado, I wanna invite Chris and Dino to please turn on their screens and uh, Dino's gonna share the screen with you. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this. Um, I'm excited to share this information with you. This is relatively a new program that Shorefront developed. And uh, I also want to welcome aboard Chris Hartzell, who uh, Chris and I have a long history together, uh, even before our roles, our current roles, what we do now, uh, when we're both in advertising together. So it's always great working with some colleagues that I've grown up with and, and learned to appreciate. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And just kind of give you more about uh, Shorefront. Uh, we established ourselves, and uh, we started the process in 1995, um, and established ourselves as a nonprofit in 2002. Uh, along with this, you know, the title of this uh, this this particular subject, um, changing the narrative. It was important for Shorefront to have a community control its narrative, uh, and especially in this situation where in Evanston we're. Um, recognizing over 150 years of uh, the African-American presence on the North Shore and in Evanston. And the reason why the part of this started uh, was changing a, 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 a thought process of, you know, why did Blacks come here to Evanston and the North Shore and, you know, filling capacity as only as uh, domestics and servants. And I've always thought that, you know, the members who were coming here were entrepreneurs. They came in to start businesses, build homes, find a better education, get involved socially in their community, and establish um, a life uh, separate that, you know, of the time period of the time, separate of that of the white community. So in a sense, there was an invisible community. And Shorefront wanted to make sure we were able to document these activities throughout its history. Um, when I first started Shorefront, uh, I got involved with a group called Pitch. Preserving Integrity Through Culture and History. And that was implemented by the then Alder Fifth Ward Alderman Joseph Kent. And he rallied uh, a few community members who were steeped into preservation and, um, and, and history and came up with this idea to, um, you know, a, sur a survey and a study to uh, suggest a preservation district honoring the African contributions in Evanston. And this group had uh, worked diligently for a better part of seven years to work on um, aspects of this. And one chance of timing on this in 1996 was the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, had their conference in Chicago. And one of the tours they took was a tour of uh, Evanston's Fifth Ward, which is commonly known here as the historic black community. And this photograph here, you see the audience turnout of that bus tour. I think there were on two coach buses with tour guides on each bus. And I happened to be one of the tour guides on one of those buses. And that kind of got me involved really, you know, intently about interviewing people and talking to uh, people about history. Um, as Pitch grew and worked on it, um, their, their process, um, they wanted to make sure they covered a few things that were important to the community and pitched this to the uh, city of Evanston. Uh, one part of it was to research and study uh, the historic legacy of the African American community and its buildings, uh, to promote these uh, aspects for among community members and have community members deeply involved in this process, helping to identify where these sites were. Um, during that same time period, uh, a report was commissioned and submitted to the Preservation Co the Evanston Historic Preservation Commission and to the City of Evanston. There were a number of presentations that happened throughout City Council meet um, meetings to help illustrate um, what the activities of PITCH uh, was trying to do, how engaged the community was, and um, how the Preservation Commission could enhance or develop a preservation, uh, preservation district. Um, the report was submitted and um, the Evanston District Preservation Commission did support it and pitched the idea to the city council, but it ultimately uh, was shelved. Um, there were a lot of you know, different concepts at that time, but one thing that came to mind was, you know, what are the limitations of a preservation or historic district? And, you know, since a lot of it was based on, you know, architecture, uh, that became more of a difficult hurdle to come across if these homes were more 
uh, modern or maybe didn't fit this architectural criteria. But we didn't know that for sure until we did more research. So it was tabled you know, around 2002, 2003, but um, I had the opportunity to kind of dust off that proposal and utilize it uh, when I was asked by our current fifth ward alderman, Robin Ruth Simmons, who approached me to uh, submit an application for a historic landmark designation for the former Foster School, which uh, became a de facto segregated school in Evanston. Um, its school history alone uh, was quite interesting uh, with not only um, the, how it il illustrated the fast segregation in Evanston's community. Uh, as Foster School, when it opened in 1905, it was predominantly an all-white school, but by 1935, it was predominantly African-American. And by 1942 is when Evanston allowed its first African-American teachers to teach in Evanston and Foster School is where they taught. So at this time, it also became the symbol of how do you integrate schools? And they used Foster School as an experimental school to uh, create a new uh, type of uh, class environment where you're busing in white students, but it's displacing black students who bus to other schools. Um, and that program then later became known as the King Lab Project um, um, uh, School and then later moved to another location. Uh, the building closed down and it was uh, sold and purchased by the um, Family Focus. And a few years ago, Family Focus was uh, getting ready to put the building up for sale and the community was afraid that the building would be torn down and made into housing. So the alderman asked if I could submit a proposal to protect the building or recognize it at least as a historic landmark. It did meet with some resistance, uh, especially from the owners of the building. And uh, I was able to navigate that, you know, utilizing some tools of pitch uh, in their reporting and their findings, but also in understanding the needs of developers to have some flexibility with the building. So I didn't necessarily want to make it easy for a developer to come in and tear down a building, but at least have to go through some type of process. Um, and then I engaged with the owners of the building, uh, indicating I'm not trying to limit the sale of, but here's the messaging. Uh, you can do whatever you want with inside, inside the building to rehabilitate it. You can even add on additions as long as it kind of, you know, resembled, you know, parts of the architecture on the outside of the building. Uh, the building had seven distinct different architectural styles. And so, um, the argument on their case was there's nothing distinctive about it. My argument was, yes, there is something distinctive about it. All seven styles are distinctive and were relevant for each time period that it was built. But in addition to that, as a historic you know, embodiment, most of the Black students went through Foster School. And I started highlighting many of the famous people that went through Foster School and why it should be preserved as such. We had Junior Mance, who's a jazz musician, produced over 45 albums. He's in the Jazz Hall of Fame uh, and taught in uh, New York, uh, the jazz piano and wrote a book on the jazz piano. Uh, also, if you're a fan of Queen Sugar, the TV series, uh, Tina Lifford started her acting career at um, Foster School on that Foster School stage. And I saw in the, in the, in the um, as the program was beginning where people were hailing from, I'm in Evanston, across from the high school on the same block that Tina Lifford grew up on. So I'm very proud of that. So we utilized the uh, program of pitch to support this. And in the end, uh, the owners of the building got behind it and also supported the historic designation of Foster School, the former Foster School. Um, and as I stated before, with uh, the early work of pitch, and engaging, uh, utilizing what I've learned from the historic landmarking of Foster School and Alderman Simmons again approaching me, you know, uh, asking if we can create a preservation district. I said, funny you say that. Uh, since I dusted off the uh, pitch proposal, let's take a look at that and also bring in two of the original members of pitch. So they can give us kind of a rundown and historic perspective of how that happened. And in that meantime, they, it, um, the, the, the two members donated all of their studies to Shorefront Archives and those boxes you see there in the photograph 
are that is that study. It's a block by block, house by house, walk by of each structure, complete with descriptions, architectural um, uh, uh, thing, um, embellishments that are happening with that building. If it's significant, if there is the uh, architect uh, uh, name attached to it, and who lived in the building, uh, it's accompanied by photographs and some other historical sketches. So that we knew with me engaging with the city, the there, we knew that no new study had to be done. It was already there. Um, but we did know that there was a process and a model that we had to look for. So I signed up to speak at the Preservation Commission, Evanston Preservation Commission. And I think we were gonna be last on the list for public comment. But right as the meeting started, they said, Dino, we know why you're here. Um, let's have an ad hoc committee I'll be on, and then several members of the Preservation Commission jumped on immediately, and we started monthly meetings uh, regarding what do we do about recognizing this historic feature. And we had these questions, how will it be supported, and what does the recognition look like? Um, and so we moved forward with that, and uh, we went forward with the whole idea of a preservation district. And Alderman Simmons was really focused on the Fifth Ward. And that's the boundaries of the fifth ward and everything that happens within the fifth ward. But there was a little educational process involved in this. And I was able to share with her is that, well, at one time in Evanston, there was no such thing as like a black community. Uh, the black population and other ethnicities lived throughout all of Evanston. And so to just focus on the fifth ward, we're ignoring other historic important sites throughout the city of Evanston. Um, but we still had this thing in mind about conservation districts. So we kind of tooled out uh, the major area, area number one, with some significant sites there that we, I labeled off the top of my head. Then we had uh, area two, that was immediate downtown area, three near the lakefront, and four in South Evanston. But as we talked more about you know, conservation districts and preservation districts or historic districts, we started thinking about the limitations of that, what kind of restrictions are already there in place that make this more difficult? What if a, a, a owner of the building or site does not want to be a part of this because it may limit how they can uh, modify the building or in fact, maybe having to tear it down and build something new. Um, we didn't want that type of limitation. And we also didn't want the city of Evanston so involved and engrossed in this where we have to go through policies and procedures and meetings just to get something acknowledged. That process can be slow and antiquated at times. And my thought process was always trying to bring that narrative and bring that control back within the community. So we had to think you know, outside that, in the end, we really did not want a historic district or a conservation district. We wanted something different. We wanted something that the community can control and have input in. We wanted something that the city of Evanston can celebrate. We wanted something that can build an archive and build heritage and build policy um, and, and build a sense of pride that we all can grow up around surrounding us. And uh, we started keying in on the word site and or sites and realizing that since it's all throughout Evanston, instead of focus on a district, just focus on sites that are scattered throughout Evanston and a new and interesting way to uh, do that. So I kind of brainstormed a bit and said, well, let me find uh, a few sites that are scattered throughout Evanston and we could focus on those to jumpstart this whole project. And that would include sites within the Fifth Ward, which was Alderman Simmons' interest, but also to recognize the sites that are in downtown Evanston near the lakefront in South Evanston and in other parts of Evanston. And so we had these few sites set up and a lot of them were like these first and we wanted to make sure that we had these first recognized um, as fast as possible. Since we already had this paperwork and information on it, it was an easy process to have everybody rally around. Now, of course, there was some feedback with a community uh, meeting I did um, where the community members were saying, well, what about this site? Well, what about that site? I said, well, those are to come. We have hundreds of sites that we could our possibilities, but we have to start somewhere. And so with these initial sites, uh, we started um, working out the paperwork with the Preservation Commission. And I ended up penning for the first time a resolution. Uh, it's a three page resolution that kind of outlined the spirit of what this project is, how the city can be involved in it, and how the community is involved in it. 
And an ultimate students kind of brought it back to me and said, well, I want some more specific. Let's start naming places. And so all the whereas were all about, you know, every decade I try and pick out a historic uh, feature that should be recognized. And so I started labeling each of these areas and what the city of Levinson can be involved in and why these um, areas were significant. So in this time that you see here, I mean, you see this is kind of a short period. It was about five months from starting with the first meeting with the Preservation Council to having a resolution passed by the city of Evanston unanimously. So if you want to see that resolution, you can download it at the city of Evanston's website. Uh, the website's down at the bottom of that slide that you see there. But it's easy if you just go to city of Evanston and then in the first search window that you see, just type in uh, uh, resolution 54R20, you should be able to find that pretty easily and download the PDF. So, but we knew after this process was done, more work is still needed. We have to talk to the community members and get them engaged. And um, um, we did that with a series of media announcements. The Evanston Roundtable picked it up and wrote an article about uh, the site. And Evanston now um, provided an article, but also with an interactive map that you can go to the, these different places. And the Daily Northwestern published a series of eight articles focusing on each of the sites that we had penned for the initial site designation uh, through this resolution. So it was a very busy active month between the time the resolution was passed through August, this whole process with a lot of media of, uh, input and a lot of community engagement and excitement. Uh, so we knew we had to work fast on providing like what is the criteria to designate for a community member to designate a site and uh, we got together an ad hoc committee an advisory committee uh, consisting of four community members to meet for this initial meeting to generate you know the focus of wording the application process and the design of the marker signage and website and so we had a series of three meetings so far um, and they're very focused and very concise. So the first meeting we um, really focused on the application process and there are four key questions, all designed to you know, in, in build the uh, argument and the defense of why a site is, uh, should be recognized. And this will help eliminate, you know, sometimes um, I've already had some conversations with community members with uh, members saying, well, my house is important because it was the first one built on a block and it hid underground railroad um, runaway slaves. I said, okay, we have to prove that though in some way, you just can't say that. So what documentation do you have for that? And uh, we cited areas where they can do further research, the Evanston History Center, the city of Evanston, Shorefront, and other uh, surrounding uh, Northwest University that may have information so that you're able to defend the fact that you said your house was the first one on that block and that it hid uh, runaway slaves. So that's what the focus is, for example. Um, so we got that wording down, but we also have a judging criteria for the committee to judge on. And the judging community is a scale of one to three. It's excellent, uh, worthy, and adequate, uh, or like the designations. I can't remember the exact wording that we use. But it was all designed to help engage and have people do more research on their work and help them with that process. So eventually everything will be approved. And I, as a committee, we sort of looking at how do we mark, um, designate these sites? What do we like showcase there? Uh, we realized that maybe families don't and or building owners don't wanna put a plaque on their property or something, some big monument in front of the building. So we, I started looking at sidewalk emblems, uh, just like you see in these cast sidewalks with like the manufacturer marker. I started doing some investigation and found that there were a few places in the United States that actually utilized these markers that could drill a hole in the sidewalk in front of the property, since the sidewalk is city owned property and you can embed it in the sidewalk and it becomes unobtrusive, but you can still see the marks as they're there. And so part of the committee, we designed a marker and we're still playing around with them. We have about 35 different concepts that we're working with, but we're getting very close to the end of what we're looking for. And uh, we wanna have these available to mark um, each of these sites as they go up. So either if the site is still standing or have been demolished since then, we wanna recognize what was once there. And companion to that will be a website of uh, brochures and flyers and at designated places will be freestanding kiosks with 
uh, for people to view where all the markers are with a map and do their own self-guided tours. But what was really important to us is that community members submit what they think is an important historic landmark. So with that, I'll pause here and see if there's any questions at this point. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions before mm -hmm. we move on to the site. So uh, could you say what the boundaries of the fifth ward are? I know we have a lot of Evanstonians on here. So just so everyone knows yeah. what the boundaries are. I'll, I'll kind of roughly put it, it's uh, Church Street to the canal along McCormick to uh, where McCormick ends at Green Bay Road and kind of cuts down Noy Street to Sherman and then back west to surrounding City Hall to Darrow back to Church Street. Okay. And then Chris is wondering, which is not clear, is Pitch an organization or a philosophy? Pitch was an organization preserving integrity through culture and history. Um, it's disbanded since then. Uh, it disbanded uh, probably around 2002, 2003. Um, but I was able to keep a lot of the paperwork of that time when um, uh, when they disbanded. Uh, part of well, in our offspring of Pitch, um, there was a historic um, like a, 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 a structural building that they um, had their offices in, and they won grant money to rehabilitate it and offer these programs. But that unfortunately failed to launch in any real way. Okay, and then the last question, uh, can you just say what the uh, website is that we, because we're looking, our staff is looking so we can post it, the website for the resolution so we could pass it, uh, yeah, post so it? It'll be the, it's, yeah, the city of Evanston.org. Uh -huh. And um, their splash screen will have a search, a search window um, right in the middle of the screen and you just type in either the resolution name or type in uh, African American heritage sites. Okay, uh, so it'll for take you to a list of links. It'll take you to a list of links. We can download the PDF. Okay, so for everyone that's listening, we're going to do that while we continue with the lecture or the speakers. It's not really doesn't. It's not lecture. Sure, it's a lovely presentation. Um, then the other uh, just question, and this might be something for the end, but someone's already wondering, are you going to have the app with a self-guided tour of the sites? Oh, we'd love to have an app. Uh, <laughs> you know, app development is uh, quite uh, expensive to develop at times, but if you, if anybody has any good leads to uh, anybody that might want to do some pro bono work of a downloadable app, or, or maybe some type of honorarium that we can offer. Um, so it won't be what I know some of the price structures are for it. Can't be near that, but we could probably do something. Okay, and we did download the, um, the link is in the chat area. So, all righty, moving along. Now we're gonna see the sites. Sure, so in process with this, um, uh, with the resolution, we want to make sure that we had at least uh, several sites to jump things off so people have an understanding of what we're trying to do and something that we could celebrate uh, moving forward. And um, so the first site is uh, the home of Edwin B. Jordan Jr., who was Evanston's first African-American alderman in the city of Evanston, who served for 16 years and um, did a lot in Evanston to break up uh, Jim Crow processes and uh, that the city of Evanston was practicing desegregated beaches and public parks, advocate for uh, housing, and uh, in the end had um, advocated for a community center to be built in the fifth ward, which was later named in his honor. Um, and Dina, you know, one of the great things about this house that I found really interesting is that it was designed by a fairly well-known architect. His name was Ernest Newton Broker, and he's very well known in Chicago bungalow uh, historic districts. And he was really one of the key guys. So this is a traditional Chicago bungalow before it got bumped up. Um, you can sort of see next to it, just on the edge of the picture, the one uh, next door. It was developed by a guy named Henry Bershlag, who bought this uh, four lots here and subdivided them into six. And initially in 1923, he did these three flat front Chicago style bungalows there. So. Uh, it has a really interesting history in and of itself. It's there on Darrow, just south of Simpson. Yes. 
And the next house uh, is also another first, Evanston, Evanston's first African-American mayor city of, uh, of the city of Evanston, uh, Lorraine Harrison Morton, who uh, hailed from uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, started as a teacher, a school teacher. And when she first came to Evanston, she came, first came to go to graduate school at Northwestern University. Um, then left Evanston again with her new husband, uh, James Morton, who um, James Morton actually lived in that house at the time prior to um, their the marriage. Uh, moved to uh, Alabama to, go, uh, to teach at Tuskegee, and then she came back to teach at Foster School. And then later, summer school at Nichols, thus becoming the first Black teacher to teach outside of Foster School. Then later, um, principal at Haven, and then she ran for alderman of the fifth ward. And then later ran for mayor and held seat for 16 years. So somewhat number 16 is pretty magical with holding office for a long time. Um, yeah, and she lived in her house till her passing. Uh, well, Evans Shorefront was uh, very fortunate to be able to do a documentary movie on Lorraine Morton called um, um, the Lorraine H. Morton. Um, has a, a, no, I can't remember. I can't remember the rest of the title, but it's uh, we can get that DVD at Shorefront. Uh, we we're fortunate to have that she was able to see the DVD before her passing. Uh, she was 99 years old, about three months shy of her 100th birthday. And those of you who know Lorraine Morton knows that she can hold court. Uh, we had a screening audience of over 100 people with uh, many family members that came. And she took the microphone away from me, stood up from her chair and spoke for about 20 minutes. And then when I, when I thought she was done, I was trying to get the microphone from her and she snatched it back and said, wait, I'm not done yet. And she just kept on talking for another 10 minutes. So uh, it was fascinating to work with her on this. And I think it's also an honor to be able to recognize because she lived within the fifth ward. If Dina, one of the things I love about Lorraine's house was that um, it was actually had been in her husband's family. Um, so going through the city building permit files here at the Evanston History Center, I found that it was built in 1908. Uh, it didn't have a, it was no designated architect or builder. The, the man who built it, his name was Bernard Hughes, and he was a gardener. I love the way he cited this on, right in the center of two lots. So it has a really nice, and it was the first house on the block um, on that side of the street in 1908. And in 1925, James Morton, her husband's father, grew up in it from the time he was 14 years old. So um, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a wonderful example of a vernacular style, a builder style vernacular. It's a little prairie box to me. It's got that hipped roof. It was stucco and the porch has some nice arts and crafts prairie school detailing on it. So this is a really nice example of vernacular house in Evanston. Moving on, the Evanston Sanitarium. And this was a hospital that was uh, developed by Dr. Isabella Garnett and Dr. Arthur Delano Butler on uh, 1918 Asbury Avenue. And this was developed because uh, at the time, the two Evanston hospitals really did not admit uh, Blacks as patients, nor as practicing physicians. So these two individuals um, opened their, um, actually Dr. Isabella Garnett was already practicing prior to that as early as 1900. Um, out of her brother's office, uh, uh, also a doctor uh, of dentistry on Benson Avenue before she moved twice, one to Oak and then later on to this location uh, with her house and another house built on the, um, the same lot behind the hospital. Um, when Dr. Arthur DeLions Butler died in 1924, they renamed it to the Butler Memorial Hospital in that same location. And then it grew from there to become community hospital at a new location on Brown Avenue and Bridge Street in Evanston. Uh, you know, Evanston started uh, issuing building permits in 1892. Uh, so anything before 1892, we don't have a definitive date on. Um, and that's one of the things I love about your initiative is that uh, it, you know, it's it's much broader and much more encompassing. Uh, so I, this house was about 1890. Uh, it's sort of a Queen Anne style, it's urban, pared down, builder's great Queen Anne, but it has that beautiful big front gable and the shingles in the gable and the clabber below it. And the little house next door was built by uh, the second owner and in 1909. 
So uh, it must have been an ideal location for um, Isabella and Arthur to have the sanitarium in the main house and then have their, their living quarters in the little one and a half story cottage on the property next to it. Yes. Yeah, next we have Butler Livery Stable. And you know, historically the Butler name comes up a lot. I mean, there are several Butler siblings and you know, the parents, uh, Cornelius Butler, um, who break, um, brought his farm down, or sold his farm in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and relocated to Evanston. Uh, one of the Butler brothers, uh, Henry Butler, uh, developed his business, and they had several locations throughout Evanston. Um, I like the photograph that you see there, the historic photograph you see there is one of my favorite ones of the building because uh, early on when I was doing research, it was the most um, misidentified building. Uh, when uh, uh, people talk about uh, the Butler Livery Stable, they always focus on the one that was on Emerson Street. And for a long time, people thought this building was the one that was on Emerson Street. And I was puzzled because I knew the address of, of the one on Emerson Street was, you know, um, 1024 Emerson Street, and this had 914. And I'm like, well, where was this? And this is not the Emerson Street building. And so when we located, you know, later on when I located it, it was on you know, 914 Davis Street address. And um, uh, you see the inside uh, photograph of what building is there now. So that was, uh, I think his third building. Uh, he also had some houses around the corner of that building that were acted as offices. And he also had a residential home that was also part of his office on Dempster Street near Forest Avenue. So I find this building unique. I employed hundreds of people. Um, it went through, um, it was in business for you know, several decades. Um, and in, this, in, in the historic photograph, uh, his business partner, Mary Hager is in that photograph. And also as well as uh, one of Emerson's first early residents, uh, uh, Andrew Scott's, one of his daughters also walked, worked for Henry Butler. Um, and she's photographed in that, um, in that, in that historic photograph as well. You know, it's interesting about this building. I had actually stumbled across it earlier this year when I was doing another history. And it was built as a livery stable in 1886 uh, by a guy named Leighton Turner, who had come to Chicago in 1830 and had the second livery in Chicago. He got burned out in the Chicago fire of 71. He had come up to Evanston and retired and then decided to get back in the business and built this property. Uh, its address is Davis Street, but it's it was set a little south of Davis along railroad there. And it was a perfect location for a livery. And Henry had been working and really going great guns. And you know, he previously had built a small frame livery at 1719 Maple uh, that he opened in 1898. And this building, to, according to the directories, he first listed this at 914 Davis in 1903. Um, so he must have been, you know, his business was going great and he was expanding and he must have been thrilled to move into this um, masonry building, ideally situated, designed as a livery and really accommodated his growing business remarkably well. Yes. It's taken with the Butler family. Um, when Cornelius Butler came with his family, uh, they purchased a lot, several buildings, and built several buildings on that lot. Uh, you can see on the uh, the fire map, there, the Sanborn map, uh, the lot pointing to the arrow pointing to the lot of ownership. And the inset picture was the last structure that was on it before it was torn down. So if you go to down there now, it's only it's a vacant lot. There's nothing on the property anymore, but a chain link fence and overgrown trees. But I want to make, and this is why having you know identifying sites is important because. Things are torn down and people don't necessarily remember what was once there. And so this opportunity gives, um, you know, precedence where people can go and see where uh, historic sites were located. You know, thank goodness for Sanborn maps um, so that we can make these determinations and see where these buildings were. And I love this story that the Butlers had this family compound there. They had three lots on Sherman and three lots on Custer and they backed up to each other and they had a couple of houses. Um, and later they had that brick masonry building that was about 1920 or a little bit after. Um, and it, I'm sorry that that building's gone. We can tell that it was a one and a half story uh, frame building because yellow means it's made out of wood with a little porch on it. And um, I think when we uh, get to see Twig's house later, that is a good indication of what that 
building probably looked like. Yeah. Uh, one interesting note on this, uh, family members from did come by uh, Shorefront one day and um, this gentleman who was a descendant of one of Coney's brothers, uh, of Henry Butler's brother, um, found uh, the original housing deeds of these properties. And he said they were almost thrown away because his aunt used it as a plant stand. They were bound, handwritten um, uh, housing deeds. <laughs> Uh, with with uh, property deeds uh, to all the houses that, are, that they own along Sherman Avenue. And a plant was on top of water, settling on top of one of the books. So he was able to salvage that and uh, he brought it over and I was able to make copies of it. So it's really interesting reading to read those early handwritten um, uh, housing uh, deeds. Uh, this photograph here is the uh, home of, uh, of, was the home of Maria and George Robinson. Uh, this is uh, historically significant because Maria is, uh, you know, we kind of indicate her as like the first black resident of Evanston. Uh, she was purchased out of slavery at age 14, um, came to Evanston with the family that purchased her. Um, and she took up residence here, first, first with the family and then later on on Dempster Street, uh, just west of Forest Avenue. Um, and actually next door to the, to the place is where Henry Butler lived. Um, and what's also significant about these two sites is where the beginnings of Second Baptist Church and Ebenezer AME Church began as well. Um, and that whole block right there was an enclave, a small black community enclave, not, not only on the north side of the street, but on the south side of the street and around the corner on Judson Avenue. Okay. Yeah, and looking through our files on these houses, um, it, it looks like they probably date, especially from the style 1860s or, or, or maybe early 70s. They were originally one and a half story, according to Sam Bohr maps, and they got bumped up about 1893 to two story houses. And um, I know Henry lived here for a while, as well as the Robinsons. And this property, this little, again, sort of a compound here with the three buildings on it, because there's another building behind that I often wonder if Henry used as a livery early days. Um, he owned that, uh, Butler owned all three of those properties on this lot from about 1906, at least through uh, 1940. And I'm not sure, um, I found a sale from 1955 um, after that. So, um, and it was, uh, you know, as you say, very far east and along Dempster Street there. Yes. Which brings us to downtown Evanston on Sherman Avenue, 1619 Sherman Avenue was the offices for William Twiggs Print Shop. William Twiggs uh, came to Evanston from Davenport, Iowa, uh, and he attended Garrett Biblical Institute uh, on the Northwestern campus. Uh, his roommate was uh, T.S. Wood, who was Ebenezer Amy Church's first pastor. And between the two of them, they published uh, the Afro-American Budget was the national periodical that circulated. It's a digest about six by nine in size with um, critical topical essays. Uh, you know, one in particular that William Twiggs wrote was should the Afro-American relocate to Haiti since Haiti was uh, you know, independent republic uh, and, and the United States is not necessarily conducive of that of the black experience. So let's leave this country and go elsewhere and start businesses there and, and continue life. So the inside shows were approximately where that building uh, stood. Um, a story has it, a family story has it that next door to the job printing at the time was a small like empty lot. And it was kind of jokingly nicknamed Twigs Park because it was full of twigs. Um, it's kind of funny that maybe have highlighted that eventually um, in the future, um, a public park in Evanston now is, uh, has its name Twigs Park along uh, Simpson, and Bridge Street in the canal running down to noise. Chris? Yeah, this building, um, I think I found this in a uh, really early picture of Fountain Square. Uh, it was there probably from the 1860s, definitely the 1870s. It was built as a residence. Um, and it's, you know, just on, it's on that nice um, triangular lot behind Fountain Square. And it was right in downtown Evanston. Um, and as you say, it was his second spot there. Uh, mm -hmm. He had previously had his uh, a building on the other side of Davis Street. Um, 
I recently gave a couple initial walking tours of downtown Evanston so that we could cover some of these spots. Um, and to accentuate your point that um, early days, they were very much part of the fabric of Evanston. Yes. Um, another site that's no longer there, and this is you know, something we're always, we're still looking you know, for new information. We're hoping to find a photograph of the church then, but it's the original location of Ebenezer Amy Church on 1813 Benson Avenue. And just a little note, just one block south, up south of that address is where Second Baptist was, or still is. Um, and, I, and again, you know, we have this uh, building that's here, and that block is kind of interesting because at the same time that the church was there, uh, next door to it, just north of that plot, is where Sandy Trent lived. And Sandy Trent was Evanston's first Black police officer in 1898. And next to that was the home of Carrie Crawford, who later changed her name to a stage name, Madam Stuhl T. Wan, who uh, was a professional extra in movies. And she had a key role in W.D. Griffith's movie, um, God, Breath of the Nation. But uh, she, performed, she appeared in over a hundred movies um, and only two with speaking roles. One was the short speaking role where she was working as a domestic in the kitchen and another in, I think it was the movie Carmen as Dorothy Dandridge's star of that movie. Uh, she played uh, Dorothy Dandridge's state of the screen grandmother and she had a speaking role in that. But she uh, lived in Evanston for a while and uh, had three sons while living in Evanston. Two of her sons got into the acting careers, um, um, acting industry as well as extras. You know, I think this is just about my favorite building uh, of all. Um, and I, I do hope we can find a photograph of it. I found that article describing it, the opening in 1883, where they described uh, the inside and uh, how it was packed and um, it was a hot day and the flowers were beautiful. But you can see by looking at the Sanborn maps that it was designed in the cruciform style, like a cross. And, um, and I love that they chose an architect to build it. This Asa Lyon was the architect that they uh, hired to build this church for them. And he was uh, a well-known architect at the time. He was considered Evanston's first resident architect. He lived here. At the, time, at the same time, he's building schools and um, the old Simpsons meat market, which was Chandler's for many years. So he was doing a lot of significant mm -hmm. buildings in Evanston. He was kind of the go-to guy's offices were on Davis. And he's done this in an ecclesiastical style with the apse at the east end for the morning light, which is all um, just um, standard procedure for that style of architecture. And um, it was a frame church, as you can see, because it's in yellow, but many of the churches in Evanston at a time in the 80s were frame um, and many of them burned. Uh, fire was a, a constant issue, which is what happened to this church about 1902. I think that was the last one. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I think people have some questions and I want to have time to share these questions. We do have questions and I think you probably could have a whole follow-up uh, program just talking specifically <laughs> about the people that lived in the houses because lots of people have questions about that. But thank you both. Um, first, I just want to mention who doesn't love this question from Dana. I'm really impressed by your work in particular in support of reparations. How can I donate to Shorefront? So we'll put that link oh. in the chat. Who don't love yes. that question? Yes, I uh, love that question. <laughs> ask it often. <laughs> we, we'll ask that question again. Um, okay, so a lot of people were just curious about uh, specific things about the people that lived in the homes. So when did, in the first home, when did Ed, Edwin move to Evanston? Uh, Edwin Jordan moved to Evanston uh, approximately 1922, right after he graduated from Harvard. He came to Evanston to attend Northwest University's uh, School of Journalism, but he only took classes, I think, less than three months, and he ended up getting a job uh, at the Chicago Bee and the Chicago Defender. Uh, he eventually became uh, managing editor of the Chicago Bee at one point, um, but he truly always wanted to work at the Chicago Defender and uh, went over there and did things with sports, but also followed issues with uh, civil rights. Great. And was uh, Lorraine Morton's house originally a bungalow? No, it was originally as it stands. The way it looks. 
Um, and do you know, uh, Joan wants to know, do you know why the butlers left Kenosha to come to Evanston? Um, as the story has it, um, Cornelius Butler was traveling to Chicago and passed, stopped through Evanston and loved it. And so he decided, I think they were just considering moving anyway, but he, when he went back north, uh, settled his arrangements up there, sold his farm and a lot of his livestock and moved his proceeds to Evanston. And that's where they started. Great. So we got a little shout out to Evanston's Tags Bakery. They have the best cake, carrot cake in the world. That's Teresa sharing that important information we all need to know. I, of course, live like four blocks from there. I'll be there in a sec. Um, so, uh, you know, this question I had also comes from uh, Eden. Where did the name Shorefront come from? Ah, Shorefront. So I had this very particular issue with long names for organizations. And a lot of times, you know, you know and, and keep this in mind, I, I don't believe that you need to have a name in something that doesn't mean what it is that you do. Um, so the common vernacular, you know, common naming structure in a lot of black museums is putting Afro-American in there or black. So you have this long name. So the Afro-American Heritage and Cultural Museum. I think it's broken down to an acronym. And then when you have the acronym, nobody remembers what the real name was, better alone than the acronym. So I instructed my then, uh, previous to our board was like this working committee that I wanted to have a name and I wanted one word. And that was the goal. And uh, so we thought about our area that we cover is you know, Edmondston North to Lake Forest. And uh, two of our um, um, former board members came up with uh, Shorefront. Another option was Shoreline. Um, uh, heritage was another word, um, but uh, we settled, we all like shorefront because we like it does mean an area and then that's what we do. And I know the lake is such an important piece of uh, Evanston. I know that's something Evanstonians love. Yes. So uh, from Maureen, we have so many of the buildings are gone. Are there efforts to preserve and protect those that remain? There are some efforts, but you know, that again has the process into its own. Um, and a lot of that we have to see if the, you know, the owners want to actually do it. And that's one of the limitations that we saw with preservation districts and conservation districts. Um, let's say if you live in, you know, in a historic house, you wouldn't historically designate it. And if it is, um, what if you want to make a remodeling, uh, any renovations to it? You have to go through the preservation council to get permission for its materials to, or for material use and likeness. And does it uphold the integrity of the building? So the, there are efforts to do it, but at the same time, we don't, with our program, we don't want to sort of restrict that as a major issue. Yeah, you know, Dina, that makes me think of how the Emerson Street uh, building, Butler's Emerson Street building was mm -hmm. just not that long ago demolished. Right. And it was landmarked. Um, and yes. I sat on the commission for many years. I, I think I missed you. I, I think the, the your initial initiative in this one, but, uh, <laughs> You know, we fight so hard uh, to uh, establish landmarks and because it does go against property value of uh, property owners wishes sometimes not property values, I think it, it helps them. But um, the Emerson Street building was landmarked and uh, they uh, over it was overridden by the city council because for the Northwestern Research Park which then never materialized but um, so it's a it's a constant it's a constant struggle to 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 save these buildings, mm -hmm. even as late as 1990, we're still losing them. And that's why I think your initiative is so great. Um, so because because so we don't lose lose the history. It's really important. And um, you know, our staff dropped in a link to the storefront legacy of the oral history. So I see there have, are a lot mm -hmm. of questions just about um, who were the people. So that might be a good. Uh, resource for uh, people and uh, we'll do another uh, shout out to the Evanston, another link to the Evanston History Center because I think that also is a good resource. Absolutely. So, yes. We have a they, lot they of have a wonderful house file. I love the house files there. That's one of my go-to when I go there is looking at the house files, especially when I'm, like when I mentioned um, Car um, um, Nellie Crawford, uh, Madam Suki Wine, I went to the house files to see where she lived in Evanston and I found that she lived on Benson. <laughs> Yeah, and I found some great stuff on Henry Butler oral histories that have been transcribed in, in our bio mm -hmm. files. So absolutely. 
Yeah, we'll drop that uh, link again. So we have a couple questions about the Underground Railroad, which you very briefly mentioned. One is how many sites yeah. in Evanston were part of the Underground Railroad? And uh, oh, and the other question is pretty much saying the same thing. So, so that that is largely unknown. There was one woman I interviewed here in Evanston where I asked her about specifically about the Underground Railroad because her comment was, when she opens it was, my mother and my grandmother shot their master and escaped north through the Underground Railroad. And I asked her, well, was there any stops in Evanston? And she said, well, that's something that my parents, they did not talk about in case they needed it again. So I say that, that Evanston could have been a stop. We don't know if there's nothing uh, that points to an actual location other than the former Chandler's building, um, which is now a courtyard area. Um, before that building was there, there was a, a wooden structure there. I think it served as a meeting house, a post office, uh, and an um, operator room. Uh, and it's said to have a cellar there that did hide escaped slaves from uh, a lumber company based in Lake Forest, uh, the Lund family, who would help harbor escaped slaves in one of the port stops was in Evanston before they went to Lake Forest and then across Lake Michigan to the Canadian border. One of the things to remember about uh, Underground Railroad stuff, and Dino, you and I have talked about this a lot, Evanston was not founded um, until the mid 1850s. Um, and so there wasn't, and, and it was founded by abolitionists. I mean, every you know, the Methodists that, that came here. So it was definitely uh, would have been a place that would have welcomed um, uh, runaway slaves and, and help them. There's a great story about Chancellor Livingston Jenks, who was a gentleman who um, helped a runaway slave in Chicago. Uh, but there, it wasn't at, you know, because the, by the time of Civil War, we're talking 1862 or three, that the um, Emancipation Proclamation, so there wasn't a lot, a, a huge community here at that time. It was, it was very sparse until right. after the Civil War. And I see a lot of questions in the Q&A. I think I could like kind of brush it really quick. Okay, do it um, really quick. Are, yeah, bus tours, possibly, yes. There's always an option for that. I'm not a descendant of Maria, Maria, Maria Robinson. Um, that's a different Robinson. They had no kids. Um, <laughs> please move from barbershop to printing. My speculation is that there was an opportunity for printing that was needed, uh, especially working with the Afro-American budget. And he, had his, uh, he also printed two newspapers as well. Um, Segregated schools before foster school. Foster school became the de facto segregated school because it shows how fast, as the black population was growing in Evanston, uh, there was a concerted effort to push many blacks into one area of Evanston, and the neighborhood school there was foster school that pushed many blacks into that. Um, uh, so Tuskegee have been associated with the construction of Butler Building, the one on Emerson Street. Yes, that's been uh, said. Um, there was ties, direct ties with Tuskegee. There were members that graduated from Tuskegee and had working relationships with Tuskegee students at that time. And uh, San, um, Sanford, uh, the Sanborn maps, Chris, there's one question on that. Oh, I'm sorry, what's the question? Oh, they, you, uh, tell us more about the Sanborn just maps. Just Google Sanborn maps, A-N-B-O-R-N. Oh, so they are fire insurance maps. There's kind of like, I think Google Earth um, back in the day. Uh, it, it, it absolutely outlined every building. It said what it was made out of, pink is brick, yellow is wood, um, for every uh, town in the country, really. And they're, um, they were done periodically and updated periodically. So you've got kind of benchmarks where you can go uh, through and see where buildings were. They're great. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the last question is, um, yes, there's a, you know, we could do scavenger hunts. I know one was done a couple of weeks ago, a scavenger hunt in the sixth ward. Walking tours, kiosks, we plan on having freestanding kiosks at the public parks that show the maps so people do self-guided tours. And we plan on having a website as well. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, please contact me. <laughs> yeah, you we've done a couple here, the, the Levy Center, uh, we collaborated with the Levy Center, did a couple of downtown Evanston. So, and we already put the link to the Shorefront Center a couple of times so uh, people can reach uh, Dino that way. Um, and I also want to mention, I took a tour with you when I did Leadership Evanston in 2001. So I'm realizing listening to you that that was an early time in your career of doing tours, probably. Um, mm -hmm. 
So anyway, thank you both. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us and information that I think is important. I know that we have so many Evanstonians on this call, and I think it really is a great opportunity for white Evanstonians to learn a little more, a different kind of history, an important part of our history that we aren't usually uh, learning about. So uh, that's why we are called to changing the narrative. It's time we start learning more. I'm definitely going to be going through the city in a different way uh, as a result of this. Um, so again, thank you to all our participants for joining us as well today. There's, you know, it looks like from my house, it's a beautiful day outside. So I want to encourage you to download the Open House Chicago app get out and do some of our self-guided tours and experiences that are on the app. We, I think this is the end of our programs for today, but we'll be back tomorrow at noon with the Chicago Cultural Alliance. Um, and then actually Evanstonians, there's a program with Design Evanston tomorrow at 5.30. They're gonna be sharing uh, information about their new book on uh, highlighting 127 different uh, Chicago, uh, Evanston architects, designers, and planners, and you're going to get to see Chris again. So I want to encourage you all to do that. And um, without further ado, I want to thank you again for participating in Open House Chicago this year, and you still have till October 25th to get out and explore our great city and suburbs like Evanston and Oak Park. Thank you again, Chris and Dino. Thanks so much, everyone.